dipsticks back here under the engine compartment. We got the dipstick here. Check the engine oil if you need to add any case here. Air filter, two stage air cleaner here. Uh, fuel filters here. Got this little water separator. Gives you a visual check on your fuel. You see that little red ring, Michael? Mm -hmm. If that thing starts to float up, you're kind of indicating you got water settling okay. in there. So we drain it, that little pit stop opens up, you can drain it out and then be mindful where you're buying the fuel. Right. Um, engine coolant here, recovery tank. Okay. Give you a visual check there to make sure you got some kind of coolant showing in there. Okay. Um, radiator package, hydraulic cooler, air conditioner condenser, everything stacked up right here hmm. on one side. But just keep that clean, make sure the leaves and stuff don't get watered up in there. All of our valving, tank, everything is out from under the cab. A lot of your other manufacturers, stuff, you have to pull seats out, tilt cabs, that kind of stuff. Everything we've got is kind of outboard. That's really cool. That was a great thing that they've done about five, six. Great design as long as the metal's thick enough. Well, and that's another thing, all metal. Okay. I don't mention that much, right. but most of your manufacturers are plastic and mm -hmm. fiberglass. Okay. Uh, washer fluid for the windshield wiper. Uh, hydraulic oil level is here. Okay. I always kind of overfill it to begin with, and this is the way you check it, okay? Okay. With it, with everything, Extended what I tell out. everybody is, is hide as much chrome as you can, but it's basically the park position. Okay. That's about as low as you can get it with sitting here on flat ground for your boom cylinder. But dipper all the way out, bucket all the way out, thumb close. This thing, it doesn't really matter because there's not a lot of oil in that cylinder, but that's the way you want to check it as long as you've got that ball floating. That's all you really care about. Okay. Um, sometimes when it's cold, you may get in it. And, and with all the cylinders, you know, with oil in them, you know, that ball may be in the middle or low here. Mm -hmm. And it's cold, it'll be here. Once it gets hot, it'll expand a little bit so that ball may float up. Okay. Biggest thing is just make sure you got hydraulic oil. Yeah. If you see a leak, address it. You know, right. it's going to happen. It's just, you know, yeah. being on top of things. Uh, to add oil, we go here in the end of this plug. Hydraulic oil. It's AW46 okay. hydraulic oil. Um, you common, you can buy it anywhere. Okay. You can also, you, with the temperature range difference, you can also use AW68. Okay. Those, both of those are real common. So as long as it has AW46 or 68, you'll be fine. Okay. What's this valve right here? That is to swap it uh, on your controls. The way I have it set now is on standard excavator controls, okay. which means your boom and bucket are in your right hand and the dipper and the swing are in your left hand. Okay. okay. Now, the other way of running the machine is- The backhoe uh, mode? Is, is backhoe controls, which is what that G stands for. I don't know if it's G, but um, you swap it over and you're basically swapping your boom to this hand and your dipper to this hand. Okay, so you're just inverting the control. Yeah. Okay. Um, long time ago, I could run them both and do it really well. Now I just, I don't run the backhoe controls hardly at all. Those old wobble stick things, it's kind of a thing with that. You play with it, see what's to me. If you're not familiar with a machine, it's much easier to learn on the ISO pattern because when you reached out and you're making a scoop, you're basically pulling both levers back to you. Right. To where with backhoe controls, you're pulling this one and maybe feathering. It's just, it's just yeah. different. I think it's uh, that's what I'm used to is the ISO. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. Battery's easy to get to. If you need to go jump something off, it's okay. right here. Easy nice. to get to. Um, if you, if you were to take the thumb off or you were going to remove some hoses, you know, not from a leak, but just remove some hoses, mm -hmm. the crank, the, the, pre, the tank is pressurized on these machines. Ah. So it's got a little relief valve on top of it. Not that it would spray oil and right. hurt you, but it might keep it from leaking so much. Like if we were going to go take that hose off now to take the thumb off, you can press that and it'll keep it from pushing oil from the tank back there. Okay. Uh, all the compartments are lockable with the key. And the four ounce key. The regular taco key key? Yes. Okay. There's one in it and then there's another store. And then all these compartments lock and then it's just a push button to open it. Um, 
And we got the GPS tracking stuff built in. Yeah, two years it comes with it for free. That's what this thing is. Okay. How much is it after that? I could not find that. Right now it's 180 a year. Oh, that's not bad. They'll send you a letter. Okay. At, um, when you start getting close to the end of your warranty okay. period, they'll send you a letter. And uh, I think Cowan actually is, is, is doing it now, sending you a letter uh, or a postcard or something saying, hey, if you want to sign up on it. The greatest thing about it is I can do telematics on it to, as far as pulling codes and stuff. I can do it from my shop. Oh, wow. I'll go over it with you in the screen how you guys can pull up codes if okay. you want to. I'll show you that part. Um, but you can call me. I can be at home if I've got my laptop. I can dial into it, pull your serial number up, and I can see what a code is when we go from there. Can if somebody was to steal it, call me immediately. We can lock it out. Well, no. I can't kill it. That'll be the next phase of this, and it's probably going to cost a bunch of money. But um, we recover 12, 15 of them a year from our rental fleet and customers' machines. You know, somebody's not, and they come get it, and they may not be a mile up the road with it sitting beside the house trailer. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, and that's, that's yeah. real stories. You know, I got a ton of them. It's mm -hmm. happened. A lot of times we'll help you go find it before you can get the police out there. You'll oh, be yeah. sitting wow. there in their driveway mm -hmm. waiting to get it back. So, grease fittings everywhere it needs a grease fitting, it's got one. So, every pin on the blade here, there's three where the mouth is, okay. or actually four, and then two on the cylinder. So, that's four. Now, are there any oh. sneaky ones on it? Oh, yeah, let's, let's talk about those in the beginning. These two right here. Okay. See those two Aha. grease fittings yep. there? The, the one on the left here greases the back side of that cylinder, and I don't give a rip if you ever grease it because that doesn't move. Right. Okay? It's a good idea. Right. But this one's important on the right. That is your turntable. Okay? So the one on the right here, and you've got a large turntable. That's one of the staples of a Takuchi machine. Largest <sighs> turntable in the industry. You know why we have the largest turntable in the industry? Because More stable. Because they designed the first one the world ever seen that had a rotating 360 degree slew bearing. Hmm. Their theory when they done it, because those bearings come in sizes that you can buy, you know, from a, from a bearing manufacturer. And their theory was, we're gonna take the weight of the machine and engineering's gonna tell us what size that bearing should be. Then we're gonna go one and a half times that. We'll never have turntable bearings. Now they did this back in the 60s. Oh wow. We're gonna go one and a half times the size of that turntable bearing that the engineers recommend. And we never have issues. And, we, and we'll never have issues. Well, they were successful. I can't remember ever putting a turntable bearing in these machines. This is my 28th year. Oh, wow. Wow. If you ever around something and you want to look at the difference in other manufacturers, especially Caterpillar, Deer, Komatsu, look at your turntable bearing and then go look at theirs. So, the, the, really, the only thing I asked you to do is once a year, if your guy, average people put 250, 300 hours a year on a mini X, right? Mm -hmm. Doing your business here, right? right? Where you're building houses, doing a septic tank, whatever. Right. Grease this every 250 hours. That's what I suggest on oil changes. The book will tell you you can go 500 hours or once a year. My deal is, hey, at least once a year, let's change the oil and do a full Right. Okay. So a lot of times that's 200, 250, 300. Don't really get specific on the hours unless you really start using it a lot right. and you're putting a thousand hours a year on it. Hey, we might want to go 500 hours. Right. That's your maximum limit. Let, let your job and your daily operation tell you how often we're going to change right. all of it. But at least once a year. Okay. That goes back to greasing this barrel. So to grease it properly, I need you to turn that grease fitting to this corner and put about eight or ten shots in. I prefer a handgun because you know yeah, you've got a Milwaukee gun. Right? Yeah. If you if you know you're getting grease in there, so turn it here eight or ten shots. Let him set up in it and turn the cab to that corner eight or ten shots. Turn it to that corner eight or ten shots. Turn it to that corner. Because what you've in. done now is you took that big old bearing and you put a wad of grease here, a wad of grease there, there, there. And then you get up in the machine and you go merry-go-round. <laughs> Spread it out, you're good to go. Don't over-grease that bearing. Don't overthink it. Okay. Don't o don't never worry about it. Okay. But just maybe once a year, once grease a year, it. Put some grease. I'd rather you not grease it when you grease everything else out here. Okay. Then have it. Just remember, grease it one time a year. Okay. Down the road, ten years from now, twenty years from now, 
your bearing's still going to be in good shape. It's got such a large capacity in there. Right. And people with a with electric gun, and they like to grease and just slam them, whatever. You can actually pump the gr too much grease in it and pump the seal out. The, oh, okay. The dust seal out the top of it. Not a big deal. You just got to work it down in there, and it's going to be nasty because you got to get that excess grease out of it. And you just work that rubber back down in there. Okay. I've done it. It's not fun. There's plenty of grease in it. Okay. Just remember it about once a year and remember those steps that I told you. It's this it's the grease fitting on the right and it's those four corners and you'll be good from now. Okay. Okay. Now the rest of the grease fittings on this thing, grease to your hardest content. You can't over grease it, you can't put too much. Spend your money from about here out, because that's what's in the dirt. Right. Okay. Spend your money on this uh uh swing tower here, and you can see some of them grease through the end of the pen and they'll be marked with a yellow symbol. That's kind of their service point um, okay. to get you used to it. But always remember, both ends of the cylinder is going to grease. Um, every joint is going to grease, maybe through the pen. And that's the way to kind of find everything. The one that can be a little bit tricky. You gotta look, you see that block that's right there on the end of the dipper? Mm -hmm. See that square block? Yep. Okay, that one greases this big pocket here, and it's probably the most important one on your dipper because of everything that that thing does, it's working, right? Right. So to grease it, we'll pick this uh, boom up off the ground, roll your bucket all the way up under, and you'll be able to get to it because it greases through the side of this block. See where that grease is oozing out of it there? The grease fitting is actually protected in that block where you couldn't knock it off, but you'll actually grease through that side to plug your gun. Easy enough. These buckets have two positions here for your H link. The two positions, the way it is now, is roll position. Okay. okay. What that means is I've got my maximum roll in, my maximum roll out. If you're digging a septic tank hole or something and you're trying to dig a square hole, you want that bucket to roll out as far as you can where you can get a straight wall in the back right? and then a straight wall in the front where you're cupping. Or if you're picking up, loading into a dump truck, you want all the roll to where you can lift high and okay. dump it in the truck. The back position straightens this H-link out and that's your maximum geometry to get bucket force on the T. So if you get in a situation to where you're digging field lines and you get into some hard chirp, rock, whatever, and you think I need a little more bucket breakouts to help my teeth dig in, pop up. Power position. Power position. Roll that pin, knock that pin out, roll it to that back position, and it'll gain you more bucket breakouts. Okay. So, so to get the, the pin out, you, is there like a... There's a bolt over here. Visible? Bolt with double nuts. And what I tell people, anytime you're doing something, get this bucket just up off the ground because these buckets aren't tremendously heavy. Right. Now, they're good, they're, they're well-built stuff. Right. What I'm saying, all of us can handle it. You get that bucket up off the ground where you can grab the tooth and kind of wiggle it. Okay. And then I'll take a bar or a socket on an extension and I'll push that pin out. If you keep it greased, it's as easy as that. Okay. Push that pin out. Uh, roll it up to where you want it, you know, make adjustment with the machine, roll it up to where you want it in the pin, and then push it back in and make sure you remember to line that hole up before you get it all the way back in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, same deal when you're changing buckets. Mm -hmm. and, and we can talk about quick couplers. If you start doing a bunch of bucket changing three, four, five times a week, mm -hmm. it's probably worth it to spend 22, 2400 bucks and put a quick coupler on here. Yeah. And it's basically, we're gonna take the same buckets, we'll put dead pins in them, and, and you'd take a bar, open that latch at the back, and it's got a hook in the front where it hooks the front pin, roll out of it. Don't spend the money till you see you need it. Right. Right? Because changing the buckets is not that big of a deal. We'll give yeah. you a little trick to doing it. Is is get the bucket, like I said, kind of up off the ground just an inch or two and, and ease your front pin out that's that's holding the thumb and everything. Ease it out, because like I said, you can push on it and wiggle the bucket and the tooth. Push that pin out and let it dangle from the H-link, then kind of set it on the ground, take the weight off of it, push the H-link pin out. When you go back with it, do that same procedure. Take your H-link and grab your, and put that pin on first where you can pick this bucket up off the ground. And then, cause you've got to line up your thumb in these holes 
and it, it can be done with just a hand. And you get a bar through there, a lineup bar through it first. And then once you get your pin started, you can just take and grab the front of the bucket. I mean, I swapped the 24 inch bucket yesterday, took the 18 off. I do them by myself. It took five minutes. Okay. You know, the trick to that, keep everything greased and everything. It's nasty, you know, right. maybe some nitrate gloves, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I keep coming in the truck where I'm getting grease all over me and I still get grease on me. Yeah. But it's not, it's not nothing but just a little bit of work. Okay. You know, not, not bad, not bad. Um, tooth prong hydraulic thumb, which is what it comes with. On the 24 inch bucket, it meshes up on the teeth. On your 36 and that 12, it kind of goes on the outside of the tee, okay. and, and then it'll mesh up in between. So if you're doing a job like where you're clearing and grubbing, and you got a bunch of smalls that you're trying to grapple up and pile up, whatever. If this one, if it's hitting the teeth and it's keeping you from picking up those small things, go to your big bucket, mm -hmm. and it may get you to where you can pick up smaller twigs. Everybody wants a thumb in these buckets to be like a grapple, yeah, like a three not. over two grapple. It's not. It's, it's made for bigger material, right? But everybody asks it to do grapple type stuff. Right. You can do it. It's just that's not what it's designed for. Sometimes it's you have to get off filthy stick. Toolbox actually comes on the machine. Huh. Got a storage here if you wanted to put some extra teeth or something in there. Cool. Um, well, yeah, because most of these stuff little, under there. <laughs> most of these machines don't come with any. Right. Uh, other manufacturers don't have any. Take the machine, you just simply turn it on. And if it needed the glow plug, it would come up in the screen right there. Right. Once you fire up, uh, Micah, this has to be up right. for it to crank. Uh, I get a lot of people call me and say, hey, my machine won't crank, especially right out of the gate. Uh, and I've caught myself doing it. I get in and throw it down and it doesn't crank. But this one will actually come up in the screen if that's that <coughs> with a picture of an arm oh, like this. Okay. It'll tell you what's wrong. When you get cranked, there's your fuel level. Here's your temperature gauge for the engine. That's throttle position. Then we turn it up and down. I wish they'd have picked a color, any color other than red. Right. It does make it purple, look like white. Just leave it all green. What would be wrong with that? Right. Somebody thought that was a good idea. Whoever the manufacturer the screen is, I'm not a fan. The other thing that they did, we got an AC on here. Every time the AC compressor is engaged, it comes up and it says orange, and it's and it's an orange AC. All that's telling you is that your AC compressor is on. You'll see it cycle through and the compressor kicks off. That'll go away. Then it'll come back on. But why orange? Why didn't we put it in green, purple, right. blue? Blue. Blue for yeah, AC like because our switch has a blue right. light in it. Again, the people that made this screen, maybe they're colorblind. I don't know. Right. Um, but that's your throttle position there. Is spin. there a break-in period on the engine that we need to run it full or half or three-quarter? The reason that I say run it full throttle is because it has a, 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 a DOC on this one. You don't really have a DPF or regen or anything like that. But the reason I tell you run it full throttle, that's where it's going to run the coolest and the most uh, air we can pump through the engine. It burns clean and it won't fill that fancy catalytic converter up back there with soot and stuff that may need to be cleaned on down the road. But again, this one doesn't have regen on it. That's the great thing about it being the horsepower that it is. So, coolest, most performance, whatever. Now, there's nothing wrong with you turning it down if you're scratching around a gas main right. and you just need to ease. But three or four hours of that in today's world is unacceptable yeah. because of the emissions stuff that we've been you know, force down our throat, okay? So, I, I suggest wide open. The machine's gonna perform and act better at full throttle than anywhere else. Okay. Loading and unloading, nothing wrong with eyes releasing on the trailer, that kind of stuff would be safe, you know. Yes, we still have an ashtray. Excavators still have an ashtray. And, and just a couple of years ago, instead of the 12-volt outlet to hook up to your phone, you know, charge your phone, 
We actually have a cigarette lighter. Wow. So the new 300 series, there's only one of those out, the 370. They did do away with it. Um, put a maintenance tray in. <laughs> go over a couple of things with you. Um, the throttle, if we've got this on, and I'm gonna let this thing on. Okay. If you've got the throttle on here, it'll idle that down, okay? All right, if we turn that off. It's auto idle. Oh no, my throttles. Where'd my throttle go? Okay. This is a call I get on Saturday mornings. It won't throttle up. Well, if somebody's elbow knocks this auto uh, XL XL on off, you've got a manual button that turns your throttle on. So you've turned off automatic and we've gone to manual, which is this button, okay? So if you crank the machine up and your throttle's not working, cycle that button right there. Okay. Or the easiest thing to do is yeah, turn that lever on. Then that way, every time you crack a lever, it goes to where you got the preset. Okay. Um, other button here is tape on that button. Well, just, I actually tell a lot of people this. There's a few buttons that I would. I'd like to take some epoxy and just glue them down. Right. Like this one here for eco and mountain mode. Uh, eco mode, you'll notice the machine not throttling up, and it's got about 85% of its available power. You don't no need point. That. You don't need that. But if you see the leaves in the screen here where it says eco, and you know your machine's not performing like it did this morning before we went to lunch. Right. Reach up here and turn that thing back off. Mountain mode is for high altitudes, and I don't think Barry Mountain is high enough to justify it. And I can't tell a hill of beans difference running in mountain mode than I can our standard power mode, which is that middle position. So I don't like either one of them on. No power mode, no eco mode, or no mountain mode, no eco mode. We'll just leave it in standard. Okay. Um, light switch, wiper, squirter for the windshield, auto desail, power modes, which we like it in the middle. This button, if you did get a mower or uh, something that you want to turn on and leave on, that's your continuous flow safety button. Okay. So if we get a mower and you got to pull everything off the front, because we only have one set of lines out there running. Right. So we'd drop the thumb, the bucket, we'd pin our mower on, hook two hoses up. Well, you don't want to sit and have to hold your thumb bar to run that mower. You want to turn it on, turn it off. Right. So what we do is we select that button, and then it turns this button in here, which is your A button, which means this side. Uh, a is this side, B is that side. That's what the button's doing. And that would turn your mower on, you do whatever you want to. When you get ready to turn it off, just touch the button and that it turns the mower off. But that's just a safety button to keep you from accidentally turning that mower on and off if you didn't intend it. This is our thumb right now. Yeah. We're backwards. And we're on we're on two-way flow. Um which open and close. Okay. If you look right here, you see these three positions? And they're controlled by this auxiliary button. Here. If I, you look, I'm just toggling through those. And the pictures don't mean anything, they're just symbols, right? But I can do three presets in here. Like if you had a hammer attachment, I could preset it and adjust the flow just for that hammer. All we have right now is a thumb. There's not a picture of a thumb in there, just imagine that. But it really, just these positions are like, let's just say one, two, three. The pictures don't are irrelevant other than if you had that exact attachment. Right. But that one, two, three position is 100% of available auxiliary flow, 75 at the second one, 50 at the third. So let's say you're grappling, you know, picking up some form boards or something that you really want to be easy with and not just crush them. Oh, nice. Take your auxiliary button here and you slow it down. Let's, let's do this. So let me start back over here. So here we are with our phone. There's, there's wide open. Go auxiliary, this is 75%. Okay, just a little bit. And then we go to 50%. Okay. Be more nice. gentle with it. I like you that. Still got all the power of it. The pressure, you don't change the pressure, you're just changing the flow going to that phone where you can slow it down and be careful with it. Good. 
Because most people, if they break something, they break it crunching the bucket up to the thumb. Or right. Anything. So I'll put it back on the fast mode. Y'all can play with it and see what you want. Okay. Uh, AC, we don't figure out. It's about as easy as it yeah, comes. It looks like an 80s. Yeah. Toyota. Cold and hot. Turn your AC on and off there. Yeah, you know, when you, when it's time. Three okay. speed fan switch. There's the radio. Y'all y'all figure yeah. all that out on Bluetooth. Depends uh, much time. Nice. It doesn't have voice uh, call in here. Right. You can sync your phone to it and play music through it, that kind of stuff. But you don't have a speaker in here for hands free radio okay. or hands free telephone. Okay. Um, button on the back side here, Micah. Mm -hmm. If you click, you see Rabbit come up. Right. That's your two speed travel. Mm -hmm. Machine's got automatic downshift, so if you put it in high right here and you're tramming across the job, you come to a hill, it'll automatically slow down and climb the hill. Uh, not going anywhere fast. So, right. you know, we're not going to drive it three miles down the road. Right. Yeah. Got plenty of time. Yeah. But, um, you know, one point something mile an hour compared to three point something mile an hour. But there's where your two speed is. When we deliver the TL8, when it gets here, that same rabbit button is on this side because you're driving it with your left hand. Oh, weird. Is it, well, that's yeah. the same. That's yeah. The same. Yeah, you'll, you'll drive. And, I guess that makes more sense. Uh, the John Deere, the, the rabbit's on this side. This one down here are for defrost in the front windshield only got us you got a little double squirrel cage fan under the seat that's blowing air and I'm really telling you this because when it gets to be 100 degrees this summer and we've got this glass bubble we're working in here that you see I'm trying to make your air conditioning the most productive is leave these shut that bottom one right here because they're just made to keep off the heat glass with this windshield um, leave those closed and, and use this air to just keep that circulation around you before you coolest as possible. The fuse panel and everything is behind this lock box here. We have to come and hook our diagnostic tool to it that connects the grids under there. Also, uh, this here flips up as a foot rest. It flips up when you need to run through. Uh, size uh, yeah. It'll swing 80 degrees uh, this way, 50 degrees that way. Okay. So you can dig around the corner if you need to. Offset dig behind the track if you're running down the curb of the road and you want to offset it and dig right behind this track in a straight line. Back to the blade has a float position on it. If you touch the button, the back to the blade is in flow. Touch it again to turn it off. Um, if you float, it's on and you go to pick the blade up, it's going to move really slow. As soon as you turn it loose, it's going to fall back and hit the ground so it'll remind you that it's on. What are they going to do? If it had an angle blade on it, okay. those that we'd use those for the control for it. This is just a straight blade machine. Okay. Not a fan of the angle blade. It's no. it's great if you're scraping mud off the asphalt out here. If you're trying to use it back to the beach, whatever it doesn't work. As soon as that blade gets loaded, it turns you into the direction you got it. Okay. Angle. So some people will find a use for it. Me personally, I would keep that 3500 bucks in my pocket in my buckets and attachments and that kind of stuff and not waste my money on angle blades. The track loader only comes with one built-in jack. It's the bucket on the front, right? Yeah. And on the track loader, you roll the bucket up and you'll heel it back on the rear sprocket and idler mm -hmm. and you're looking for the sag under the track. But with a mini excavator, it comes with two built-in jacks. One on this end, Big old arm hung out there. Mm -hmm. So basically, put your blade down and jack it up. Put the bucket down, jack it up off the ground, and just walk over here and look underneath the track. On these two rollers right here, mm -hmm. what you want is these these roller guides. You want them just reaching the bottom of that roller right there. Okay. Not really any tighter than that. Okay. okay. If you if you get your gun on them and you suck them up in here, that's probably too tight, and you're going to notice a power loss because you got them. So run it first 20 hours, 25 hours, be mindful of it. You can kind of see it. If it doesn't look taut like it is now, mm -hmm. you start seeing some sag here in those in those bellies. Just stop, jack it up, take your gun, one bolt out, loosen the other one, take the grease gun, pump it out. But like I said, you're sucking those track guides up to about the bottom of that roll. Okay. Oh, okay. so you adjust the tension with grease? Yes. Okay. Yeah, simple grease cylinder, 
All it comes with is a rod, a barrel, and it's got a grease fitting and a check plug that holds the pressure. And it just pumps and it's pushing that front idler right there. Is that as you pump grease in, it pushes that idler okay. out. That's where you take your attention. There's there's tons of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Aftermarket, you get exactly what you pay for. Right. This is a Bridgestone OEM track. That's what Takichi uses OEM. That's the best track money can buy. So here's my suggestion. If you've got this machine and you get 2,000, 2,500 hours and it's time for a set of tracks, don't you dare go buy an $800 track off the internet. Okay. Because you're not going to be happy with it. It's going to probably let you down pretty quick. Okay. But if you have this track and you've got 800 to 1,000 hours and your ground conditions have chewed that track up and it's time to replace it, go buy an $800 track and see if it'll live 800 hours. Right. I see what I'm saying. Yeah. Don't 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 overthink it. it. Just depends what you're doing with it. Tons of stuff out there right now because of the world situation. Track availability is an issue. Where it's never been before, but because of supply chain issues mm -hmm. and a lot of people like United Rental and a couple of these other Sunbelt that kind of stuff, they bought up a big source of tracks because they knew things were getting tight. So you may not have the greatest availability of OEM stuff and the higher dollar aftermarket stuff. In my opinion, if it was mine, you read in the book, I think it tells you every 500 hours. In my opinion, every time I change the engine oil, I drop that little bit of gear oil in those final drives. I drop it out and change it because it's just like a pint, pint and a half. And it's something real easy to do. Make you a little cardboard deal that sticks in under where it, when it drains, it just runs out either into a pan or because like I said, you can jack it up off the ground and get to where you fit a pan or a bucket under it. But I'd change that final drive oil every time I change the engine oil. Okay. If you forget it one time, you'll be good. Good next time. Right. But people will buy these machines and keep them 27 years and never change that oil in there. And then they'll come in and go, this thing's only 27 years old, damn final drive.